choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. On July 20th, 1969, with the whole world holding its collective breath, NASA achieved a goal that was literally out of this world. It put the first humans on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. That was more than 53 years ago. Years later, on December 19th, 1972, the last NASA mission to the moon took place. Nearly 50 years later, NASA has yet to put another human on the moon. Despite advancing technology and increasing awareness, NASA has not been able to replicate the successes of the 70s. What happened? In this video, we explore the real reason behind NASA's failure to send more astronauts to the moon in decades. One of the Earth's closest neighbors is the moon. However, since the distance is measured on the cosmic scale, that is some 384,400 kilometers. If you're able to drive to the moon, it would take almost 6,000 hours going at 40 miles per hour. However, astronauts make it there faster. Human flights to the moon take longer than uncrewed missions since NASA obviously has to be careful if the astronauts are to land safely. On average, the nine crewed NASA missions to the moon, including Apollo 8, Apollo 10, Apollo 13, and the six that actually landed on the surface, took just over 78 hours, or three days, six hours, to reach lunar orbit. The quickest mission was Apollo 8, which took two days, 21 hours, and eight minutes, while Apollo 17 took the longest, with a time of three days, 14 hours, and 41 minutes. These times include the time spent in Earth orbit. The moon has fascinated humans enough for us to dare send some of us over the enormous distance to check things out. While gazing at the moon at night, have you ever wondered where it came from? There are several theories as to the origin of the Earth's satellite, and you can pick any one. The giant impact hypothesis says the moon formed when an object smashed into Earth in its early days. Earth itself came from the leftover cloud of dust and gas orbiting the young sun. The early solar system was a violent place, and a number of bodies were created that never became full planets. While Pluto may come to mind as an example of such bodies, one of these crashed into Earth not long after the young planet was created. Known as Theia, the Mars-sized body collided with Earth, throwing vaporized chunks of the young planet's crust into space. Gravity came in by binding the ejected particles together. And thus, the Moon, the largest satellite in the solar system in relation to its host planet, came into existence. This kind of origin would explain why the Moon is made up predominantly of lighter elements, making it less dense than Earth. Essentially, the material that formed it came from the crust while leaving the planet's rocky core untouched. As the material drew together around what was left of Theia's core, it would have centered near Earth's ecliptic plane, the path the Sun travels through the sky, which is where the Moon orbits today. At least one point in support of the theory is that the Earth and Moon have similar compositions. But there is also the co-formation theory, which is even more interesting. The principle behind this theory is that Moons can form at the same time as their parent planets. Gravity would have caused materials in the early solar system to draw together at the same time as the Earth was formed from particles binding together thanks to gravity. A planet-moon system like this would have similar composition, which is actually the case. This type of moon would also be located just where the moon is located. Scientist Robin Canner proposed that the Earth and the moon were formed at the same time this way when two massive objects five times heavier than Mars collided. Apparently, there has to be a collision for anything to form in the cosmos. Canop's theory continues that after the collision, the two similar-sized bodies then re-collided. Yes, another collision. Earth then formed and was surrounded by a disk of material that combined to form the moon. And here is the third theory, which thankfully does not involve any collision with the Earth. Perhaps Earth's gravity snatched a passing body, trapping and making it its own. This is not so strange in the cosmos, as other planets got their moons in the same manner. A case in point is Mars and its twin moons Phobos and Deimos. This theory says that a rocky body formed elsewhere in the solar system could have been drawn into orbit around Earth. However, such orbiters are often oddly shaped rather than spherical bodies like the Moon. Also, their paths don't tend to line up with the ecliptic of their parent planet, which is the case with the Moon. Regardless of how the Moon came to be, by the early 60s, the US was interested in sending humans to the Moon. 
The effort formally started when President J.F. Kennedy made an appeal to a special joint session of Congress on May 25, 1961. He said, in part, I believe this nation should commit itself to achieve the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. However, the history of NASA's missions to the moon won't be complete without the mention of the space race involving the Soviet Union and the US. Weeks before Kennedy's speech, Russia had launched Yuri Gagarin into space in a spacecraft that orbited the Earth, clinching the title of the first man in space. The US as a nation wanted to pull one back, and this ensured there was lots of support for Kennedy's moon program, known as the Apollo mission. And five years after the president's speech, NASA was ready to conduct the first unmanned Apollo mission. However, when the space agency tried to launch a manned mission from the Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral in Florida, tragedy ensued. A fire broke out and killed three astronauts. But that setback would not stop a determined nation. Eighteen months later, Apollo 7, the first manned mission, successfully orbited the Earth and tested most of the sophisticated systems that would take the astronauts to the moon. While many people remember the exact Apollo mission that landed astronauts on the moon for the first time, NASA actually launched a manned mission that took astronauts to the far side of the moon back in March 1969, but there was no landing involved. That was the Apollo 8 mission. In May of the same year, NASA sent three astronauts on Apollo 10 to orbit the moon as a dry run for the big event that would come two months later. On the morning of July 16, 1969, with the whole world watching, the Apollo 7 mission took off from the Kennedy Space Center. On board, there were two astronauts that would achieve global fame, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong, the mission commander. However, there was another astronaut whose name may not ring a bell, 39-year-old Michael Collins. After a journey of 76 hours, Apollo 11 reached lunar orbit on July 19. The next day, at 1.46 p.m., the lunar module Eagle, manned by Armstrong and Aldrin, separated from the command module where Collins remained. He would not walk on the moon, but two hours later, the Eagle started its descent to the moon's surface. At 4.17 p.m., the module touched down on the southwestern edge of the Sea of Tranquility. Armstrong immediately radioed to Mission Control in Houston, Texas, one of the most famous messages ever received. The Eagle has landed. At 10.39 p.m., five hours ahead of the original schedule, Armstrong opened the hatch of the lunar module. As he made his way down the module's ladder, a television camera attached to the craft recorded his progress and beamed the signal back to Earth, where hundreds of millions watched in great anticipation. At 10.56 p.m., as Armstrong stepped off the ladder and planted his foot on the moon's powdery surface, he spoke one of the most famous quotes. That's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. Aldrin joined him on the moon's surface 19 minutes later, and together they snapped photos of the moon's terrain and planted a US flag. This was followed by a few simple scientific tests and a presidential phone call with President Richard Nixon. By 1.11 a.m. on July 21st, both astronauts had returned to the lander and closed the hatch. The two men slept the night on the moon before making their way in the Eagle back to the command module. They took samples and rejoined Collins for the ride home, which ended with a splash in the Pacific Ocean at 12.50 a.m. on July 22nd to a hero's welcome. Aldrin and Armstrong became instant celebrities. NASA would repeat the moon landing five more times before calling it quit on December 14, 1972. In total, NASA landed a dozen people on the Earth's satellite. The last humans to walk on the moon were Harrison Schmidt and Eugene Kernan of the Apollo 17 mission. Twenty Apollo missions were planned, but the last three were cancelled. What exactly happened or didn't happen? After conquering the moon, the next logical step was establishing a permanent presence there. From there, NASA could expand into setting up a fuel depot for sending spacecraft to deep space, facilitate the launch of massive space telescopes like the James Webb Space Telescope, prepare for manned missions to Mars, or even kickstart tourism to the moon. However, several hurdles stood in NASA's path. While the spirit of competition spurred on the project at the initial stage, there was opposition to the whole mission. On the day Apollo 11 took off, not everybody at the launch area was clapping. A group of 500 mostly African-American protesters led by civil rights leader Ralph Abernathy arrived outside the gate to the Kennedy Space Center a few days before the launch. They brought with them two mules and a wooden wagon to press home the contrast between the shining white Saturn V rocket 
and families who couldn't afford food or a decent place to live. If you don't know who Abernathy was, he was a close associate of Martin Luther King Jr. It was a year later when NASA launched Armstrong and his fellow astronauts to the moon and Abernathy and his comrades were present to show their displeasure. In actual fact, the Apollo space program had a divisive effect on the American populace. While a faction supported the mission and saw it as a unifying and energizing project, another factor considered it a waste of money and misplaced priorities. The last group felt the money could be better spent solving American societal problems. The question was, should America have spent $20 billion to win a race to put the first men on the moon, or should the country instead have made that kind of financial and political commitment to tackle the host of problems that bedeviled the planet, including racial discrimination, pollution, and gender inequality? Abernathy met with NASA's administrator at the time, Thomas Paine, and requested that NASA support the movement to combat the nation's poverty, hunger, and other social problems, which Paine agreed to do. In fairness, NASA tried to fulfill the promises Paine made to Abernathy. For example, NASA engineers took sensors initially used to detect contaminants in space capsules and converted them to measure urban air pollution. Another project took spacecraft insulation and made new kinds of walls and windows for public housing. A year after the iconic landing, opposition to the program remained strong. Gil Scott Heron even released a song featuring lyrics opposing the missions. Running with coyotes, the weather streets are paved with gold. In the ensuing months and years, support for the project waned. The nation had recorded its triumph over the Soviet Union and had moved on. Other issues took center stage like the Vietnam War, civil rights, women's rights, the environment, and so forth. In fact, less than a month after Armstrong and co. returned to the Earth, nearly 500,000 young people caravaned, hitchhiked, and walked through standstill traffic to the Woodstock Music Festival in upstate New York, where they danced in rain and mud to songs critical of the country, especially for its involvement in the Vietnam War. Has the story changed today? The answer is no. Public interest in lunar exploration remains lukewarm. At the height of the Apollo program, only 53% of Americans said they thought the program was worth the cost. Most of the rest of the time, US approval of the Apollo missions hovered below 50%. More recently, more than 57% of nationwide respondents to an insider poll agreed that returning to the moon is an important goal for NASA. But that number does not tell the whole story, because only about 38% said NASA should send living, breathing humans back. Others who want the US to land on the moon say robots could do the lunar exploring. But interestingly, Americans are not totally averse to crude missions to deep space. 63% said NASA should focus on sending astronauts to Mars. This means Elon Musk may not have trouble finding volunteer colonizers for his Mars ambition. However, 91% think NASA should focus on scanning the sky for killer asteroids. Another huge problem NASA faced was funding. Space missions, especially when crewed, are hugely expensive. You simply can't take risks with human life, and that seriously complicates missions. Take, for instance, NASA's budget for the entire 2022. Congress allocated $24 billion, which sounds like a lot of money. However, when you consider all the programs run by NASA, it is obvious there is not enough to send people to the moon. The JWST, for example, cost about $10 billion. NASA is also funding the Space Launch System SLS, which has become a money sink. NASA is also awarding a contract of nearly $4 billion to SpaceX for a lunar human landing system. NASA also has to fund missions to the Sun, unmanned, of course, Jupiter, the Kuiper Belts, the Nancy Gray Space Telescope, and the list goes on and on. In comparison, the US military got $777 billion. The fact is that NASA's budget has shrunk over the decades. It peaked at 4% of the federal budget in 1965, but has remained well below 1% for decades. President Trump did call for a return to the moon and then later an orbital visit to Mars. The directive I'm signing today will refocus America's space program on human exploration and discovery. But given the ballooning costs and snowballing delays related to NASA's SLS rocket program, it was clear there would not be enough funding to make it to either destination. But what if the US were to bankroll 
the Apollo missions today. How much would that cost? A cool $120 billion. But there is more. A 2005 report by NASA estimated that returning to the moon would cost about $104 billion, which, thanks to inflation, would be more than $133 billion today. This brings us to another issue with going back to the moon – politics. As the president and administration changed, so did the federal government's focus. Going back to Trump, if his plans had worked, NASA would have returned to the moon toward the end of his second term in office, but of course, he wasn't re-elected. Preparing for a manned mission to a place like the moon takes a period of time that exceeds the theoretical two terms of a sitting president. And incoming presidents and lawmakers often scrap the previous leader's space exploration priorities. In 2004, for example, the Bush administration tasked NASA with coming up with a way to replace the space shuttle which was set to retire in addition to returning to the moon. NASA drew up the Constellation program to send astronauts to the moon using a rocket called Ares and a spaceship called Orion. NASA spent $9 billion over five years designing, building, and testing hardware for that human spaceflight program. But what happened? President Barack Obama was sworn in. The Government Accountability Office released a report about NASA's inability to estimate Constellation's cost, and Obama decided to scrap the program and approved the SLS rocket instead. While Obama's successor didn't scrap SLS, Trump changed Obama's goal of launching astronauts to an asteroid, shifting priorities back to the Moon and Mars missions. So where have such frequent changes left NASA? These expensive priority swaps have led to cancellation after cancellation, a loss of about $20 billion and years of wasted time and momentum. But then there is another hurdle that NASA's return to the moon faces apart from public support, funding, and politics. Going to the moon is incredibly difficult. The moon may appear attractive in the night sky, but it's a death trap for anybody daring to venture there. You may see photos of the Apollo astronauts smiling and waving at the camera, however, they came close to death more times than they could count. In fact, President Nixon had a speech prepared for the event of the astronauts dying. That the men who went to the moon to explore in peace will stay on the moon to rest in peace. Did you know that NASA felt the highest risk of death was Armstrong and Aldrin not being able to launch when leaving the moon to rejoin Collins? In true form, the agency prepared for such a possibility, and it was the grimmest you could think of. If they had failed to launch, Armstrong and Aldrin would have been abandoned on the moon. Mission control would have closed down communication, a euphemism for abandon, and the two men would have the option of starving to death or committing suicide. President Nixon would then have had to read the tragedy speech. The speech reads in part, Fate has ordained that the men who went to the moon to explore in peace will stay on the moon to rest in peace. These brave men, Neil Armstrong and Edwin Aldrin, know that there is no hope for their recovery, but they also know that there is hope for mankind in their sacrifice. These two men are laying down their lives in mankind's most noble goal, the search for truth and understanding. They will be mourned by their families and friends, they will be mourned by their nation, they will be mourned by the people of the world, they will be mourned by Mother Earth, the dead send two of her sons into the unknown. Luckily, the speech became public only decades later, but consider what it took NASA to land Armstrong and Aldrin on the moon. The moon's surface is covered in craters and boulders, making landing very risky. Before the landing in 1969, NASA spent billions of dollars developing, launching and delivering satellites to the moon to map its surface and help mission planners scout for possible Apollo landing sites. Imagine how disastrous it would have been if the Apollo lunar module landed on ground that was too soft and sank. However, landing the lunar module is half of the problem. Even before stepping out, the astronauts and NASA back on Earth have to deal with a menace, regolith or moon dust. If you don't have to deal with regolith every day, you don't know how lucky you are. The moon is covered in this fine, talc-like top layer of lunar dust that is several inches deep in some regions. It has been electrostatically charged through interaction with the solar wind for billions of years. Remember, the moon does not have a protective atmosphere. Regolith is very abrasive and clingy. It gets into everything, fouling up spacesuits, vehicles, and systems very quickly. When astronauts move about, they kick up 
clouds of regolith. When they drive around on buggies, they kick up more regolith. Designing and testing systems that can withstand the moon's regolith is expensive and technologically intensive. Just designing spacesuits that can withstand the rigors of regolith and other hazards is costing NASA billions of dollars and years of research. Even sunlight will try to kill you on the moon. There is a 14-day stretch of sunlight and with no atmosphere, you are completely at its mercy. If you survive, you will then deal with another 14 days of complete darkness, where some of the coldest temperatures in the universe will try to finish you off. And one more issue is NASA's workforce. While the agency has a lot of talented individuals on its payroll, the fact is that they are graying. Recent polls show that more American kids want to become YouTube stars than NASA astronauts. How is that a problem for NASA going back to the moon? There is no running away from it. Young people are essential to this kind of endeavor. That is where most sparks of ideas come from. For example, the average age of the people in mission control for Apollo 13 was 26 years old, and they already had a bunch of missions under their belts. Today, the average age at NASA's Johnson Space Center is nearing 60. Let's hear what you think of NASA returning to the moon in the comments section below.